Hey y'all, already subscribed. Welcome back my darling. And if this is your first time stopping by or you have not yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Subscribe. Subscribe my baby doll, subscribe. So today we are going to be breaking down this makeup tutorial using the brand new Bailey Sarian X Estate Venice Fling Palette. I'm obsessed with this. I have not stopped using it since I got it. So this look is with that palette. Also, we are going to be breaking down the Netflix documentary, I Am A Killer, specifically talking about the episode In Her Hands. This one is an interesting one because in this episode, she admits that she is in fact the killer. However, there is a twist on it. So she has a reason. I really wanna know your all's opinion at the end of this, you guys, because I have an opinion of my own. And remember, these are my opinions at the very end of this, and opinions are like assholes. We all got one. Let's not get our panties in a knot because you might not agree with my opinion or somebody down in the comments' opinion. If I see you being nasty, your comment is going in the trashy. <laughs> also, y'all, I do want to let you guys know, I do say it in the breakdown, but the beginning part of this is all according to Lindsay. So, none of that, none of this in here is facts other than what, you know, investigators state and stuff like that. But anything that I'm quoting Lindsay on is not a fact because, of course, Robbie Mast is no longer here to defend himself. So, I do want to make that incredibly known. Also, there will be a secret emoji in this video somewhere, and if you comment it down below, it will get you an extra entry into my 100 subscriber giveaway, which we are over halfway there to. Now into today's video warning. Viewer discretion is highly advised. Today's video is going to be talking about sexual assault. Also, we're gonna be talking about mental and physical abuse. We're also going to be talking about drug use. We'll also be talking about suicide, suicidal thoughts, and also, of course, murder. If any of these things are triggering or something that is sensitive for you or a tough subject, I completely, completely understand, my darling. Please do not subject yourself to any type of hurt, whether that be mental or emotional or anything. Please click out of this video. You're not gonna hurt my feelings at all. I love you regardless, and we'll see you in the next one. This video is for those only 18 years and up. Viewer discretion is highly, highly advised. All right now, let's get into this video. I am a killer on Netflix. We are gonna be specifically, again, like I already mentioned in the intro, speaking specifically on, I believe it's the first episode titled In Her Hands. So first, I just want to go ahead and start off with In the United States, more than 8,000 people are convicted of murder per year. And of those 8,000 people, only 10% of that is women. Today, we're going to be talking about one of those prisoners in that 10%. Inmate number 3018877. In 2015, in Billings, Montana, Lindsay Hagen took the life of her boyfriend, Robbie Mast. Lindsay grew up in Portland, Oregon, and in high school, as many of us do, she became very, very rebellious. And she started smoking marijuana, started hanging out with all the wrong people, the wrong crowd. And at the young age of 15, she started running away. And not long after that, she was living on the streets. Now, not long after Lindsay started living on the streets, she started using methamphetamine. And shortly after that, she would start using methamphetamine and heroin via a needle. Lindsay said in the documentary that by the time that she got to the age 16, she considered herself as an addict. One day at the age of 17, Lindsay said that she hadn't had her period. And so she decided to take a pregnancy test and lo and behold, she was pregnant. Now, as soon as Lindsay finds out that she's pregnant, 
She said that all she wanted was to be a mom. And so she decided to get clean and to have her baby. In 2003, Lindsay returned home to her family to have her baby. Lindsay would end up having a son. And once she was clean from drugs and alcohol, Lindsay then decides to enlist in the National Guard and her mother would be the one to take care of her son while she was in the National Guard. Lindsay said that she loved the National Guard, that it was really something for her and she enjoyed it so much. She said she loved being, you know, tougher than the boys and being able to do more than what the boys could do and that it was really, really something that, you know, she was proud of. She, it was something that she had worked really hard to accomplish and she was doing it. At the end of 2013, Lindsay meets this man who is also in the army. At first, of course, everything goes great and then eventually things, they go south. They go south really, really quick. Lindsay said that he loved to drink and that he would get really, really mean to her, especially when he drank whiskey. He would spit his food on her. He would call her names in the book, every name in the book, call her nasty. She said in the documentary that there were even words that she wasn't even comfortable enough saying on camera what he called her. She said it became a very toxic relationship very, very quick. In the documentary, she said, quote, he would lose his mind over things that didn't matter or that weren't real that he made up in his head, end quote. So one of the things that he was very known to do was he did not like her job. He did not like her working with all these men. And so he would accuse her of sleeping with these men. And in the documentary, Lindsay says that, you know, she wasn't doing this. And so she would tell him, you know, I'm not doing this, you know, quit accusing me of doing this, I'm not and that he would not take no for an answer. And until she admitted to what he was wanting her to admit to, he would beat her. In June of 2015, Lindsay says that she is using the restroom and he comes in and he is accusing her once again of doing something with these men at her work. And she said that she was just over it at this point. And so she stands up to like defend herself. And she says that he immediately spits on her like he normally did. And she says that this like really upsets her and they start arguing. She says, you know, once he spits food on, on her that, you know, they start arguing even more. And at this point, she like rears back to hit him and she said that when she did this, he grabbed her hands and broke both of her hands. And she said that she still to this day like remembers the sound of that snap and what it sounded like. After he broke her hands, he then put her in a chokehold and she went unconscious. And he would be arrested for this. So there was actually a charge over this incident that happened. 2015 would also be the year that she would quit the National Guard as well. Lindsay says that at this point, she started drinking really heavily. She said it was really bad and that there wasn't a day that went by that she didn't drink. That is how she would first meet Robbie. She would meet him in August of 2015 at a house party. And when they first met, remember, she literally just got out of this relationship. Well, Robbie was just getting out of an alcoholic anonymous rehabilitation or rehab. And so they were both at a place in their life, at the very vulnerable place in their life. But Lindsay says that she thought that Robbie was carefree and he had a beautiful smile and she couldn't resist herself. She also talked about how Robbie loved the traveler lifestyle. He would like hop freight trains and he would hitchhike to travel to different places across the country. Robbie would never stay in one specific place for very long. 
Like he would be there a couple weeks, a month, and then he's off to the next place. I also did just want to cut in here and mention that all of this that I am saying right now is according to Lindsay. There is no proof that this is how things went. All of this is according to Lindsay only. There is unfortunately no second side to this because unfortunately Robbie is no longer with us. So this is all according to her. So I do want to let it know, be known that these are not facts. These are all, this is all according to her and what she claims, how she claims events happened. And it's kind of up to you to determine in the end what you think. And I am going to share with what I think. So as soon as Lindsay finds out about Robbie's traveling lifestyle, she's like, okay, well now you have a place to live. You can live with me. All I want is to come home to you every day. That's all I want, you know, is for you to be home when I get home. And he's like, oh, no, no, that's not my life, ma'am. No, no, I cannot stay in one place at once. I like to, I like to travel. And so she's like, okay, then I'm coming with you. So, yeah. She starts traveling with Robbie. Lindsay describes their relationship as best friends. She said that they were in love. She said that they traveled together and she said that she remembers, you know, Robbie looking into her eyes and telling her that he loves her. And, you know, she just remembers being so happy with him and, you know, that he was the best man ever and that she just was over the moon in her life. She said that this changed very quickly. She said that on their trip, they're going into the mountains and, you know, she's all excited. This is all, again, according to her. Um, she's like, oh, look, the mountains, Robbie, look how beautiful they are. And according to her, Robbie looks at her and says, I wish I could make you happy, but I just can't. And it's not you. It has nothing to do with you. Well, of course, any woman at this point is probably going to think, if this is true, like any woman is going to think, oh, yeah, it's 1,000% me. But she says that he says, you know, it, it's not you. She said that Robbie began to talk about the other life and how he was tired of this life and he didn't want to live it anymore and he was over it. And it didn't have anything to do with her, but that he was completely over living in this life and he wanted to see... He wanted to go on into the afterlife. Lindsay says in the documentary that she took this personal. She said she took it personally and she felt like he just didn't want to be with her. Um, and that Robbie really quickly, apparently, according to her, um, told her that that was not the case and that he was just not happy. He hadn't been happy, he wasn't happy, and he didn't want to deal with life anymore. Of course, according to her, she's thinking that she isn't good enough. And so she just still thinks, you know, that it has something to do with her. And then she said he started making these gestures towards his head. He started making bang, bang gestures towards his own self, okay? And she said that this really scared her and frightened her that he, you know, wanted to do this. Lindsay then says that one day, Robbie looks at her and says, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to live life anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. But Lindsay tells him, quote, I know a way we can do it that won't hurt. You'll just go unconscious and you won't wake up, end quote. This is what Lindsay says in the documentary. And I want you guys to remember how her boyfriend hurt her. Remember? In the beginning, that is just a little odd, don't you think? But this is all according to her and how things happened. She said that after she told Robbie this, that she seen a sparkle in his eye and that he had never looked so happy, according to her. That he was so happy that she was gonna do this for him. She then says that this makes her cry. This upsets her that he really wants to go through with this. And she said that Robbie hated to see her cry. And after she started crying, she 
claims that Robbie's like, oh, no, 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 you know, never mind. I don't want to make you sad. And she says that he hated to see her sad. And so they go to bed and they cuddle together. She also says before they go to bed and everything that Robbie says, you know, I can't believe you would do that for me. And she's like, I would do anything for you. I love you, etc." And then they call it a night. He holds her and they go to bed. The next morning comes around and she, Lindsay says that they wake up and she apologizes to Robbie and says, hey, I'm sorry that I couldn't do that for you last night. And he's like, yeah, I, I figured you couldn't do it. And she said that this made her even more sad because she was hoping that he would come around and say, oh, you know, I changed my mind. I was just drunk or whatever. She said she was hoping it was just the drinking and everything. Well, I just found that odd that she thought that. Well, that's exactly what she says in the documentary, but that's how she felt. I just found that a little odd that she thinks that way because if he was saying this quite frequently there lately, like if I loved someone, I would want to get them help. I would want to see what I could do to try to prevent this. According to her, he had been talking about this and this was something that he had been saying he wanted. And they get to Billings, Montana. According to Lindsay, they pull into a Walmart parking lot and they go in, they get them some wine, and then they come out and they hang out at Walmart in the parking lot. They're hanging out in the Walmart parking lot and she said they're just enjoying the day. And now she then says that this is when Robbie brings up how he doesn't wanna be here anymore. He doesn't want to live anymore and he's talking the same stuff that he has been, according to Lindsay. So they, she looks at him and she's like, okay. And that's what she says in the documentary, that she literally just looks at this man and says, okay. Mentioned before she had told him that she knew of a way that they could do it and he wouldn't be in any pain. She then says that she puts her arm around his neck as in a chokehold, okay? Y'all listen very carefully, and I hope you remember the beginning of this video. She puts him in a chokehold, and she says that he gasps for air for a minute, and then eventually would pass away. Now, she says at this point, she panics. She starts to panic, and so she says, well, I need to leave. She's thinking to herself, you know, I need to leave here. I can't, I can't be sitting here. And so she goes to drive away. Well, as she's driving away, she's like, okay, well, I need to buckle him in his seatbelt. She buckles him in the seatbelt and pulls off into the highway. And then immediately after pulling onto the highway, she's like, no, I need to give him CPR. So she says, this is all according to her. She pulls over and is giving him Robbie CPR. And she says the next thing she knows, she had, she hears a on the glass of the car. So she says that she turns around and it is the police. Now, according to her, she says, I just killed him. She completely lets the police know right then, I just killed him and she is taken, of course, to jail. So now we're going to bring in Dory and her husband, Gene, which is Robbie's mother and stepfather. Now, I want to go ahead and mention now that this is the only family of Robbie's in this documentary, and I will explain why that is later. They live in Clearwater, Florida, and at this point in the documentary, they start to describe Robbie and his mother described him as adventurous. In 1996, the uh, that's when Dory and Jean got married and that's when, of course, Jean became Robbie's stepdad. Well, when Robbie turned 18 years old, he goes up to his mom and Jean and says, hey, I want to go live on the road. I want to go do my own thing. His mother said, Dory, she said that she actually passed out 
in the driveway as he left because she was so scared for him and didn't know what in the world he was going to do. He was only 18. He didn't have anything, so she was like scared for him as her son. You know, what in the world is he going to do at 18 with no money, no job, no nothing? Dory would say that Robbie was gone a year and 24 days before they would hear anything from him. They heard nothing from him for a year and 24 days. Jean said that Robbie knew that the lifestyle that he had would just hurt them more. And so this is why, according to Jean and Dory, why Robbie would just refrain from contacting them at all is because he didn't want to hurt them because he knew that his drinking and everything, that they would know that he was drinking and that this would just upset upset them more. So that is the reason why Robbie refrained from calling them and keeping them posted on his life. It's also mentioned in the documentary that over the next six years after this, that they would have very little contact with Robbie at all and that the last time that they had seen Robbie prior to his passing was December of 2014. Now at this point, they were talking about Robbie's rehabilitation center that he was in, and they were talking about how they were sure that they would hear from Robbie when he left the rehabilitation center because Jean and Dory were told by the supervisors at this facility that Robbie was doing really, really well. So they were sure that they were going to hear from him. But unfortunately, they did not hear from Robbie. And four months after he was released from this facility, that is when he would pass away. September 17th. This is when Dory gets a call. She says she gets a call from a lady and the lady just informs her that Robbie is dead and that's what she says in the documentary that the lady just says Robbie's dead and she just couldn't believe it she said that she just kept screaming like Robbie come back come back and she just said that she felt like you know she kept saying that he would of course Dory was extremely upset that Robbie had been murdered and she said it upset her on top of that because you know she felt like this was just somebody who murdered Robbie because they felt like, you know, he didn't have anybody. And she said that that's what bothers her, That that's what was bothering her the most at that point is because she's felt like somebody just murdered Robbie just because and thought that he didn't have like anyone who cared about him. And she said that that was far, the farthest thing from the truth, that Robbie had many people who loved and cared about him. Dory also says that she would learn that Lindsay is the one who committed this murder from the newspaper. And Dory says when she finds that out, she's like, no, 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 because it says, you know, his girlfriend. And Dory says she was like, no, 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 who is this woman who has done this? Who is this? So now we're going to bring in Officer Hallam, who was the lead investigator on this murder and also the one who, of course, interrogated Lindsey Hogan. He has been a police officer in Billings, Montana for years. And he said that he can't think of another time where someone has come in with this many details and then says, oh, but they wanted, they were suicidal, but they wanted me to do it. He said that you never hear that. This is when they bring the interrogation tape in. And this is where my mind gets completely blown. So Officer Hallam talks about how Lindsay had said that Robbie was unconscious and then he, she started pulling her hand away because she wanted to stop, she didn't want to do it anymore, and that he kept putting her hand back. And Officer Hallam makes a good point. He's like, how could that be? If he is unconscious, how could that happen? If you're unconscious, you cannot move someone else's hand up to and from, to and from, like you can't move around like that. So how could that be the case? Good point. He also mentions about how when the police pulled up and, you know, next to her and, she, you know, she drove off and everything, they had already seen her in the Walmart parking lot. So he was asking her, you know, like, where were you going? 
you know, what were you doing? And she was like, oh, I was going to bury him or like drop his body off somewhere. Guys, this interrogation is like the complete opposite of how she portrays it in the actual documentary. Like she is sounding very, very like just, I don't know, just odd. And if you were planning on burying him, what about the CPR you talked about? Because you mentioned you were doing CPR. What about that? She didn't mention anything about that in interrogation at all. She only mentions that in the documentary. So a little bit more about the interrogation. There's one part that literally just gets me. And it's where, you know, the they're talking, you know, he's obviously like questioning her. He does not believe her story at all. And he's like, no, come on now. I've been doing this a long time. And you cannot tell me that this, you know, that this is how it happened. I'm not believing it. It's just not, you know, a believable story. And she then goes on to say that she knows it doesn't sound believable, but this is what he wanted. Then she says, I must admit, I have always wanted to kill someone with my bare hands. Literally says that, you guys, in the interrogation. In the end, Lindsay would plead guilty and be sentenced to 60 years in prison. Now, back to Dory and Jean, because there are some more interesting parts with them. So, for four, the past 14 years, Dory and Jean have done this ministry at prisons. Like, that is their job. That is what they do. So they're talking about when they forgave Lindsay and Dory says, well, God forgave us. So it was our job to forgive her. Also in this part of the documentary, this is where you learn that they speak to Lindsay basically on a daily basis, you guys. They tell Lindsay that they love her. She says they love them. Like they talk daily, daily. And they now feel that it is their duty to spread the message of forgiveness, okay? And 10 months after the murder of their son, they would forgive Lindsay completely of the murder. They now run a program titled Why Forgive? And in this documentary, they actually show people in this group and them at a church, like telling their story, talking about, you know, their son and what happened and the whole story surrounding that. They talk about Lindsay, their relationship with Lindsay. And on June 10th, 2017, they would actually go from Florida to Montana to go and actually visit Lindsay. Jean talks about the first meeting and how close him and how close Lindsay and Dory have gotten and Dory like says that she's just this that Lindsay is just this amazing human being and etc etc and that they really do love and care about Lindsay. At this point in the documentary, Detective Hallam plays for the people there filming the documentary a recording of himself with one of Robbie's best friends. And she has a completely different story. So she lets Detective know that days before, actually the day that Robbie was murdered, that they made a pit stop off to see some of Robbie's friends. When they make this pit stop, she says that Robbie is making it very well known that he is still madly in love with Kate. Now, who's Kate, you may wonder. Kate is Robbie's ex-girlfriend, okay? He's talking about Kate right in front of Lindsay, how he wants to see her, he misses her, he loves her, etc. Lindsay never mentioned Kate anywhere in this documentary. But the friend said that uh, Lindsay was looking very, very Jelly Manelli, that she was looking like she was not having it. And all of this to me is fishy, fishy, fishy fried. Why did you not mention that part, baby? <laughs> Why not? That seems like a part you might want to let us know when you're telling us the whole truth, you know, you did this and et cetera, et cetera. This is part of your truth, is it not? I also want to just let you guys know, they met on August the 20th of 2015. 
Robbie passed away on September the 15th of 2015. For those of you all who are bad at math like me, that's 26 days. They knew each other 26 days. So now we need to put this in perspective, you guys. Robbie is talking about Kate. They have known each other. Lindsay and Robbie have known each other 26 days. That is not even a whole flip flop in month, you guys. And she acted like at the beginning of this documentary that they were so in love, they were best friends. When it got to this part in the documentary, I literally thought they had been talking for years. I literally thought they had been talking for years. Also, I do want to mention that I have to read this because it's a lot of people. Robbie's father, brother, stepmother, stepsister, and all of his friends declined being in this documentary. Many of them say that it is bad to give Robbie's killer a voice, to bring her a voice. And they're not, they're not going to support something like that. Some of them also believe that Dory and Jean are exploiting Robbie's death for their own interest. Which remember you guys, they have worked with prison ministries for 14 years. Now they bring this information to Jean and Doris, to Jean and Dory. If I've been calling her Doris, her name's Dory. They bring, bring this information to them and they're like, what do you, you know, what's your response to this? And Jean is like, you know, I feel like all of this has really brought purpose to not only Robbie's life, but his murder. That literally get like makes my daggum blood boil. What are you talking about? This woman literally, like I'll share my opinion in a minute. I'll share my opinion in a minute. I'm about to just give it all now. Also at this point, Dory makes it known how she, you know, forgave um, Lindsay and how it's done so much for her. Jean also said, you know, at first, you know, I wrote my letter and was like, dear Lindsay. He was like, but I didn't think of her dearly. He was like, now I can write my letter and I think of her dearly. He was like, and it's, you know, important for us to forgive. I just don't know if I can get down with the get down on this. I, I really, really don't. And I'm all for prison reform and you know there are a lot a lot a lot more than i can even say right now innocent people behind bars and it's gross but i really and truly feel like this person did this crime i really do you guys there's not one other person that ever heard this man say any of these things the only person that quote unquote heard this stuff was Lindsay, and Lindsay only knew this man 26 days she even says in the documentary towards the end i didn't really know him you all didn't know each other that well but this man was telling you this since like this sensitive and you know this is his deepest darkest secrets like he's telling you this stuff because none of his friends know his family don't know so it has to be like a deep dark secret right if you're not telling your friends you're not telling your family this is something like deep i mean even his ex kate didn't know this and he like talked about kate like he loved kate even they do bring this up to Lindsay later you know what about this kate information like you didn't tell us this kate information and she's like oh yeah i remember them mentioning i remember him mentioning kate we got an argument about it but it wasn't that big of a deal like he told me that he loved me but why didn't you mention that information why didn't you mention that you guys had an argument days before his murder like that's important information you know, and she said that she was jealous about it and etc. but that he said he loved her when she's the only person who says that. Another really important part is that in the state of Montana, after a prisoner has spent 25% of their sentence, they become eligible for parole. Part of them being released from prison they take into consideration the victim's family. They bring this up to her. And they're like, what do you have to say about this? 
what do you have to say about this, Lindsay? And she's like, I don't even care about that. I'm not taking advantage of them. I appreciate them. I appreciate them and I love them. I, I, I don't even think about that stuff. So Lindsay Hagen could be eligible for parole in 2030. They then ask her about the interrogation. You remember the part where she says, oh, I've always wanted to kill someone with my bare hands. She goes on to say that she doesn't even know that person anymore. That she doesn't remember saying that and she can't believe she said that and that this was something that Robbie wanted. So now let's get into my final freaking thoughts, which is something we're going to start doing in every single video. So let's get into it. My final thoughts on this is this, this really just irritates me because there's just so many red flags here. There's so many red flags here. They gave her the opportunity to tell the story in the beginning, okay? So I would say the first, I don't know, 20 minutes is nothing but Lindsay telling the story, okay? She left out so many important parts. She didn't even mention that they went and seen his friends. And that's an important part to this because this happened days before he was murdered. Okay, she acted like the, you know, couple days prior to them getting to Billings, Montana, that he had been saying every day how he wanted his life to end. He didn't mention any of this to his friends ever. His friends never heard of this information. Also, she didn't mention Kate, which Kate is a very important part of this puzzle because this is someone he is known to have loved. Nobody ever knows other than Lindsay of him ever loving Lindsay. Also, they were together 26 days, you guys. That's not even a full day a month. She didn't mention that information. I think she's a liar. I think she's a liar. Do I think that his mother and stepdad are, you know, using his death for their own stuff? I hope not because that's gross. I really and truly hope not. But you want to know who they remind me of? Carol Baskin and her husband. Please go watch this documentary and leave down in the comments below if Dory and Jean do not remind you of Carol Baskin. And they're from Florida. I don't know. It's just too much. I don't believe her. I think she did it. I think that justice is being served by her being behind bars, which like I said, there is so many people behind bars that are innocent. I'm so much for prison reform. This is just one case where I feel like that they got, they they caught her in the act, literally caught her in the act. And I am sending out all of my good vibes, prayers, and thoughts to his brothers, his dad, his stepmom, his friends. I, you know, I send you all peace and love. And, you know, I think that was damn awesome of y'all that you all be didn't believe in this and you all didn't get in this documentary because that says a lot about y'all. You all stood your all's ground and didn't want to give her a voice. And I think that's awesome. I do. But yeah, you guys, what are your all's thoughts? You know, sound off in the comment section below. What do you think about this? This is different. This is different. Also, be on the lookout for Sunday's documentary because we are doing our first prison documentary. I do want to use this platform for prison reform as well. That's something that I really believe in and I think that our country seriously needs to work on. We have a horrible prison system and it needs reform bad. So I do want to start watching some of those documentaries. I want your all's inputs on prison reform as well. What are your thoughts on the prison system in the United States? What do you guys think in your state? Because I know so many states are so different. How is the prison, how is prison reform in your state? How often do you hear of prison reform in your state? Sound off in the comment section below and let me know. Also, don't forget there has been a secret emoji in this video somewhere and if you comment it down below, it will give you an extra entry into my 100 subscriber giveaway, which I think we are weeks away from. So please be sure that you are subscribed and for extra entries, you can put the secret emoji in the comment section. I love you guys so, so very much. And until next time, bye guys.